Welcome to Coffee House. Today we have a book that was published in 2014. One of the most potent means of modern manipulation is race-based gaslighting. There are disparities, therefore give me money and power. Virtually all Democrats use this method at some point, and a large portion of Republicans. So are the policies implemented allegedly on behalf of black Americans helping or hurting? This book, Please Stop Helping Us by Jason L. Riley, How Liberals Make It Harder for Blacks to Succeed, is our focus for today. And as always, we will go through the contents of this book. We will do an analysis where we talk about the good and the bad of it. And then we will do a big picture to wrap it into a broader understanding of the world. If you guys want to, of course, I have books that are linked in the bottom. Nothing too heavy. It's all just funny, lovely, fun stuff. But the heavy one will be coming. It's in the works. So the contents of this book, the intro talks about criminal justice and suggests that the culprit for the disparities in, in the application of justice is black behavior. It's related to culture as opposed to the kinds of things that are cited as the reasons, such as racism. Now, Frederick Douglass, one of the most important figures historically, period, said, and I'm paraphrasing, your doing with us has already done the mischief with us. And the author suggests that you have to give black people a chance to stand on their two legs. But the point of what Frederick Douglass is saying, of course, is that it's the interventions that are the things that are causing the problem. It's not a problem with the black people. It's not a problem with racism that hasn't been tended to. It's the interventions that are the problem. So next chapter, Black Man in the White House. This is Obama's second term, where unemployment was at 9% in 2011. His approval rating fell under 50% for the first time, and yet black fealty remained when it came to the voting. The black and white unemployment gap had increased under Obama. The black and white earnings gap had increased under Obama, but it had decreased under Reagan, even with a bad economy. But this has long been the strategies the left has encouraged race-based allegiance. Race consciousness, the more of it that you get, helps cohere the political left. So that's why you don't hear about black-on-black -black crime, but white-on-black crime, though uncommon, is something that you hear about whenever it happens. And even sometimes when it doesn't. <laughs> and then he talks about voter ID. This is one of the most important things when it comes to democracy in our elections. Voter ID is supported by most people, regardless of race. The vast, vast, vast majority, better than 90%, support voter ID. And it makes perfect sense, of course, because how else are you supposed to determine whether somebody is legally entitled to vote? And in 2012, you had a higher proportion of black vote despite increased voter ID laws. And this is something, and this is me adding this, that you see in more recent elections as well, that you have a high proportion of black turnout, notwithstanding whatever allegations there are about voter IDs being racist. So then there's this reference to Booker T. Washington and how Booker T. Washington was more about the idea of self-development. He said that there were, there were cultural issues that had to be addressed and that it wasn't about the some external miasmatic racism that's keeping black people down. But around this time when you had this churning of civil rights and the whole question of what needed to be done to ensure that black people had the same opportunities and say in the progress of the country, you had MLK kind of win out and be lionized as the example of what to do. And his example was based primarily on activism. So it was a means of pushing back against the system in explicit ways as opposed to the, the Booker T. Washington approach, which would be to enrich the culture and focus on self-development as opposed to this kind of generic activism. Washington also put a premium on working with others. He was for being hardworking, intelligent, and patriotic, and not for being aggrieved. He thought that long-term, that the whole idea of perpetual grievance was a problem. Then there's a reference, of course, here we go, the most important, as I've said many a time, the most important intellectual for the 21st century, Thomas Sowell, found that political activity had little to do with group advancement. And he cited other groups, Germans and Asians especially, who came to this country in the same station as black people. But over time, instead of focusing on political clout, because Asians had very little political clout, even to this day, there aren't that many Asian representatives when it comes to the political class. But they focused on succeeding in economic ways and in societal ways and cultural ways while tending to avoid politics. So Germans and Asians did not grow when it came to political activity, but did grow when it came to the economics. 
And the benefits of that approach, I mean, are demonstrated in spades. You also have this issue of, because you had much more black participation proportionally increase when it came to politics, but you had the issue of the fissure between black leaders and black people. Even today, you have this very clear disconnect between the kinds of things that are important to black people and the things that they believe when it comes to things like abortion or prayer in school, as you have when it comes to black leaders. And this one uh, hits pretty hard. It's much more important to have a black man in the home rather than in the White House, suggests the author. Culture Matters. The author goes in now to his past. And this has been one of my favorite. Another book that was similar to this where it was talking about kind of the black experience and getting away from the cultish allegiance to democratic politics was Blackout by Candace Owens. And both of them have this discussion of their past and like their family experiences and their experiences in the neighborhood and the town and the city where they grew up. And this is provides a, a clear, even if it's somewhat anecdotal, it provides kind of a, a clear window into very obvious distinctions between approaches when it comes to culture. So the author says that he had a lot more shared sensibilities. He grew up kind of middle class, and he had a lot of more shared sensibilities with white kids, so he tended to spend a lot more time with them. So just the kinds of things that they liked, that they did, the way they talked, all, the, all those sorts of things, he had more shared sensibilities with them, so he'd spend more time with them. But he had a friend who was also, who lived near him, and he was best friends with initially, who also grew up middle class, but the worst aspects of black culture won him over. And he said that was something that happened a lot, where the worst aspects of black culture would win over some of even the, the middle class black people that were around him. And you ended up with this culture of minimum effort and this culture of derision toward academic achievement. One thing he talked about was when he would enter a group of black kids or meet new black kids, then they would make fun of him for trying to talk white or acting white because he wanted to do well in school or something like that. So it's these cultural things. And you see, uh, he doesn't talk about this in the book, but you see a very stark distinction culturally between that and the way Asian families approach things like academics and working hard and, and all that. So then you have this kind of enabled by the teachers as well in, in these areas where you have teachers who have more black kids expect less homework and required less of the students. And you have these calls, these explicit calls to change the expectations because there are black, more black kids in the school. Of course, none of this explains African immigrant success. When you have immigrants from places like Nigeria and they come here and they do much better on every metric then they should be suffering the same if it were a matter of, you know, all the individual acts of racism that were accumulating to disenfranchise somebody. Other teachers, you know, things like the language and sagging pants and these kinds of things were explicitly defended by a lot of liberal teachers and liberal educators and people engaged in the education system to suggest that you can't criticize, you know, bad grammar or the kind of language used, like even curse words and those kinds of things. And you can't criticize sagging pants because it was discriminatory or somehow wrong to do that. The author points out in Philadelphia in 1880, it was roughly similar between households when it came to black and white and how many parents, you know, whether it was two parents or not. And this was 1880. So this is still riding high, you know, the levels of racism. And then he references here Thomas Sowell's uh, Black Rednecks and White Liberals. Of course, we've read that, and it's a very, very important book. And talks about how most of the practices that were adopted by Southern blacks and then exported to the North, the Northern Enclave, came from Celtish, white Celtish immigrants who went to the South, the American South. And I can't remember how many details he went into, but these are things like using the word axe instead of ask, using the word ain't a lot, the honor culture that made someone more inclined to, you know, fight when their honor was besmirched or something like that. These are things that came from the Celts when they immigrated from Europe to Southern America. That's why you have so many similarities between white rednecks in the South and black culture in places like Chicago and Baltimore. After the immigration, those, those practices were imported into those places. The Enemy Within, this is the next one. So he talks about how he was racially profiled many times throughout his life. He lived in Washington, D.C. at one point, and he was stopped by the cops and taken out of his car and put on the ground, and they realized it wasn't him and, you know, just shuttled him on his way. But that happened multiple times when he was in Washington, D.C., 
He said it was a factor of race and age, because as he got older, it was far less likely for it to happen. But he also cites the fact that he worked as a stock boy. You know, he had a, a couple of jobs when he was growing up, and it was almost always black people who were doing the stealing or black people who were, you know, engaging in some kind of mischief related to the store in the, the two kinds of jobs that he worked. And so it made sense to do the kind of profiling that a lot of people do in those contexts. So this leads in, this is a nice segue into his discussion of the book The New Jim Crow, which was much heralded by the white intelligentsia. But he points out that it doesn't address the crime rate. So it talks about how there are disparities when it comes to the enforcement of crime, but it doesn't look at the disparities in the crime rates of the populations. It talks about how some of the most violent cities are run by blacks like Baltimore. So it's far less likely that those are motivated by racial animus. And those are the reasons that there are disparities when it comes to enforcing criminal laws. And he goes through a whole litany of studies here discussing how when you control for particular things like crime rate, then the disparities disappear or, or are often in favor of black offenders. And he brings up an old canard that we've heard many a time is when it came to the, the crack versus the powder cocaine and how there were these laws passed that were really harsh on crack cocaine. And this has been used over and over and over again to suggest that there was all this racism because powder cocaine was primarily used by white people and crack cocaine was primarily used by black people. But he points out that it was black representatives, community representatives, who demanded the harsher crack laws. And this was primarily because those were far more more likely to be associated with crimes of violence, the use of this kind of crack, as opposed to the powder cocaine. But it was black community representatives who were demanding these things. The next chapter, Mandating Unemployment, talks about how Dubois and Booker T. Washington opposed unions and goes into the history of union racism and then goes into minimum wage laws and how those are actually terrible for everybody but disproportionately terrible for black people. So when you have an, an increase in minimum wages, you tend to lose jobs. He went through this survey. There was a study of 100 studies that showed that the loss of employment increased when the minimum wage goes up, and they did it by percentage. They could see how many jobs specifically were lost whenever it went up. And the studies that tried to show a positive correlation between these things were almost invariably on very short terms. So it would be before all the layoffs started, so just within a couple of months, they would say that there were positive benefits to people who were working when these minimum wage laws went up. In 1930, the black unemployment was actually lower than white unemployment. And this was something that you see throughout history is that notwithstanding all of the horrible racism and the legal discrimination and the legacy of slavery and everything that came after that, the Civil War and everything, notwithstanding all of that, you still had general parity on all these societal metrics between black and white before you get to the extreme government interventions that came about, you know, throughout the next couple of decades after that, and especially in the 60s. So raising the minimum wage disproportionately harms black people because they tend to be younger, so they're more likely to need those kinds of jobs, and are more likely in poverty, so again, they tend to need those jobs more often. The increase in minimum wage is just too broad and too crude, especially at a federal level, to address the kind of people that it needs to address. So when you raise the minimum wage, it's much more likely to go to a teenager in the middle class than it is to go to a single mom in the ghetto. So then there's a discussion about education, disparities in education, and how it's not about spending, and how the unions want to continue to focus on more per capita spending, teachers with master's degrees, and the student-to-teacher ratio, but the teachers' unions are almost exclusively interested in the job security of adults as opposed to the educational benefits of students. They're dramatically involved with politics and becomes this laundering scheme wherein teachers unions get more funding when Democrats get in the office and then they donate a lot more money to Democrat candidates and it's just this feedback loop. But even more important to that is this idea that they're much more focused on the job security of adults and that creates incentives that are very bad incentives like wanting to keep bad teachers employed because it's another dues paying adult. And wanting to just have more employees, such as over the past multiple decades, and we talked about this in another book, but over the past several decades, 70% of the new money that went to education went to increased administrative staff, as opposed to paying teachers more or better education for students. What that does is it increases the number of dues-paying members when it comes to teachers' unions.
So there's a discussion of Dunbar. We've talked about that before, of course. Uh, Dunbar was an all-black school that had excellent standards and education. The students who came out of Dunbar had higher scores than their white counterparts, but this was a school that wasn't widely and long-term supported just like the charter schools, which have shown when it comes to the objective measures of how it, how good it is for students, these kinds of schools are the ones that provide the most benefit to students, but they don't provide the most benefit to teachers' unions. So you had these two failing public schools in New York that they were trying to close, and they wanted to replace them with charter schools. And the unions fought to keep the schools open, even though they were undersubscribed, they had way fewer students than they were able to take, but they still employed the teachers there who would pay the dues. And that's what the unions were doing, was fighting to keep members employed instead of what's best for students. Then the next chapter talks about affirmative discrimination and brings up Thomas Sowell again and his discussions about affirmative action and how it makes people worse off and how the burden of proof shifted. So instead of people having to prove that affirmative action was actually beneficial to the recipients of it, it became that you had to prove that it was bad for them. And there's this discussion that's recounted in the book between Thomas Sowell and, you know, somebody who was asking him a question. And uh, Thomas Sowell was asking, okay, well, how do we know that it's actually benefiting anybody since it hasn't so far? And, and the person said that you have to wait for a sufficient period before you can be able to determine this. And at the time, the person said that we need like 20, 25 years, but it, something becomes unfalsifiable. Since that time, it's been another... 20 to 25 years, it's been about 50 years that they've had to try to implement this thing properly and show benefits to people who received it, and that hasn't happened. When you word things a certain way, then it changes the way that people respond to it. The more accurately that you describe affirmative action, the less it's supported. 92% of people will say that college admissions or employment should be based on merit, but when you word it different ways, then you get different supports. Then we get some references to Clarence Thomas and when he was challenging the affirmative action policy, saying that not only is it discrimination, but it doesn't help. It's actually bad for the people that you're pretending to help. Before affirmative action, you had black poverty that was reduced by 50%. From 1970 to 1990, after affirmative action, you had the poverty rate go from 30% to 31%. That's over 20 years of affirmative action. You had black people rising faster when racism was socially and legally acceptable. And the income disparity within the black population actually rose greater than between black and white. Then he goes into score gaps when it comes to standardized testing. And talks about how if race were just a tiebreaker, like say you have two students that were equal on everything, but affirmative action suggests that in a tie, it goes to the, the non-white person because of the legacy of discrimination, that sort of thing. If that were the case, then none of these Ivy League schools and none of the surrounding schools would have this level, this number of, of black applicants. Of course, in California, the one, one of the very few things that California did right was it abolished affirmative action pretty early on. And what happened was that you had these natural increases, especially in graduation rates. And that's really important because the people who were then admitted to these schools were people who were qualified to be admitted. And just naturally, you have an increase in representation of different races. But the people who get there end up graduating instead of changing their major to something easier or dropping out or something like that. Be coming discouraged with the whole process. And this, I think he puts this really well, is that affirmative action reinforces stereotypes of black inferiority. And this is kind of the psychological collateral damage that I was talking about in other contexts, is that even if the person who's advocating these kinds of things is the most pure of heart and just trying to accomplish something positive, which I don't think that's the case, to be honest, but even if they were, collaterally, it reinforces this idea of black inferiority, just suggesting that they need the extra help. It's just suggesting to everybody else and to them that they're just not capable unless they have this extra benefit. And increasingly, it's not just white people who are have the most to lose in this context, it's Asian people. Because they are the ones who get disenfranchised the most, especially in college admissions. But another way that he puts it is that blacks have been turned into playthings for liberals. They are not responsible as long as somebody somewhere is using the N-word. And, of course, he suggests, as the title would suggest, that this is actually really bad for the people that, that these policies are pretending to help. <laughs> So, yeah, that's the book. We're going to go into the analysis. 
There are great contributions here to the knowledge base. We discussed Thomas Hull before, and he brings him up multiple times. Important ideas that he has. Culture matters, of course. It's empowering instead of stultifying. It's much more true than random acts of unidentified racism being the cause of issues. And the things that he cites, you know, that show how much better the disparities were when racism was not only socially acceptable, but legally required in cases like the Jim Crow laws. So before we had all these government interventions, we had lower income disparities, more intact families, better test scores, better reductions in poverty. You had Dunbar kids scoring higher than white kids. These things were all happening naturally before the government stepped in to try to do something about it. So the interventions are making things worse. We need school choice. We need to remove the death grip of unions on education. Stop front of action. No minimum wage. Make the entire conversation about personal responsibility. And we have to champion the ideas of Booker T. Washington over the ones of MLK when it comes to their methods for change and what upshot that has for how society works and how people are and what is the best method of getting ahead. Another thing that he talks about was, well, I think he was referenced in Tom, Thomas Sowell, but he talks about how other groups like the Germans and the Asians and African immigrants, they get here and it's because of their cultural practices that they are super successful, especially relative to the native population, but especially the black native population. So big picture wise, America has kind of a unique means of manipulation, which is a unique vulnerability Dishonest demagogues can always use any disparities to bludgeon credulous Americans who are just trying to live their lives. You know, people who aren't going to look deeply into these questions. Nobody uses the disparities between white and Asian or Indian in the same way, even though they're often as pronounced as the disparities between black and white. But we have to, I think, I'm not, I, it needs to be more forceful than that. We really have to end the use of race-based statistics. People don't have the capacity to genuinely understand complex statistics, just period. Every statistic that we use should have 20 parameters at least equally presented, and then people will stop putting stock in their understanding of complex phenomena. But so much of the time, what they do is this univariate analysis where they say, we have this one variable, race, and here's a conclusion that we drew based on this one variable that we're emphasizing. And now let political demagogues use that to try to manipulate people or make people afraid of something or something like that. So that needs to be ended. We need to end it altogether. Race-based statistics are not empirically meaningful and they're very easily abused. So we need to get rid of them. Anyway, it's been great talking with you. So that was Coffee House for this week. And the next one we're going to do, I'm not sure. I know there were a couple of books in the last two tranches that we didn't ever finish. But the next uh, fiction book is Salman Rushdie, Midnight's Children. That's the next fiction, for sure, that's going to be coming up. And I'm going to try, I want to get through this 100 books. I want to get all the way through that. And so I can say I've read all the best 100 books of all time. But actually, recently I've been reading a lot of business books, you know, tons and tons of those. So I don't know how entertaining or useful it is to talk about business books on, on here. I know I've done a few before, but I'm not sure how, how much that'll, that'll help. Anyway, so thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you on the next one. All right, bye. Bye. <laughs>